Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I was recently asked a life extension related hypothetical question that I would like to address in this video. The hypothetical is this. If I had a billion dollars in charity money to distribute between the SENS research initiative and cryonics, how would I do it? SENS stands for Strategies for Engineered Negligible Senescence. This is the approach that was envisioned by Dr. Aubrey de Grey for combating seven primary kinds of aging-related damage and thereby restoring the biological youthfulness of the organism. And cryonics is the preservation of legally dead individuals in an attempt to keep their bodies intact as much as possible in the hopes that future technologies would be able to reanimate them. So this is my answer. First of all, I'd like to say I don't discount cryonics altogether. I think it is a far superior alternative to what currently happens to most people after they are declared legally dead. Either they're buried in the ground or they're cremated so that there is no trace of their bodies, at least no identifiable trace, remaining. And for me, those approaches are not palatable. If I had the resources to do it, I would pay for my own cryonic suspension and that of my family. Now, this is kind of outside the scope of that hypothetical because presumably I would not be able to use that charity money just to benefit me as an individual and my proximate personal interests, though probably within that hypothetical world, if I had disposal of a billion dollars of charity money, I would also be quite well off materially myself, so I would be able to do this. And in the past, in real life, I did donate once to a cryonics-related initiative the cryopreservation of a young woman named Kim Swazi, who had been diagnosed with terminal brain cancer, and she was younger than I am. She was 23 years old at the time of the diagnosis, and it was a very tragic situation because she knew she only had months left to live, and she was wondering how to preserve her being in any sense of that term. She wanted to live on, and she saw cryonics as her only hope, and she launched a very admirable, very passionate campaign of activism throughout the internet, all while being terminally ill and having months to live. So I had great admiration for what she was doing. I pitched in a little bit financially to help get her cryopreserved, and she was successfully cryopreserved uh, in January of 2013. Unfortunately, that means she is no longer alive at present. Uh, whether she will be reanimated in the future is, of course, an open question, but I certainly hope she would be. That being said, in the hypothetical, I would donate the billion dollars to SENS. And I would donate the entirety of that amount, however much I had at my disposal. Of course, that would be a wonderful hypothetical world to live in. I think with that sort of contribution, the problem of human senescence could definitely be solved within our lifetimes. And that really is the reason why I would make that donation for the people who are currently alive, myself included. I think that cryonics may be a reasonable bet for those people who have no other alternatives, who are terminally ill, who believe that they're going to die no matter what, either because they're too old to live to the time when negligible senescence will become a possibility or medical cures will be developed for the conditions that they expect to get. So for those people, paying for a 
cryopreservation makes sense, donating to cryonics makes sense, but because of where I am right now, my current life expectancy, according to the actuarial tables, according to life expectancies in the recent past, even without any technological progress happening, my current life expectancy is good enough that I do have a reasonable chance of surviving to that age of longevity escape velocity when human medical science will have advanced sufficiently that some people will not ever enter a state of legal death. But of course, that's not a certainty. Future progress is never guaranteed. It's contingent. It does not occur according to some inexorable law of history. So it is in my foremost interest to make sure that that progress happens rapidly enough that I would not need to be cryopreserved. Now, there are some interesting philosophical questions also surrounding cryonics and the preservation of what I call a person's inus, or what could also be called a person's subjective continuity, which is the sense that I have of being me, the ability that I have right now to experience life from the vantage point of me. There could be certain kinds of preservation of an individual's pattern, even, for instance, an atom-by-atom -atom reconstruction of a person's body that would not preserve that inus or subjective continuity. For instance, if another version of me were constructed alongside me atom by atom from scratch through some wonderfully advanced technology, that person would experience the world from a different vantage point, having similar patterns of thought, having similar content and memories in his mind, but his subsequent experiences I wouldn't be directly aware of. And I don't see any difference if I were dead or alive as to whether I, as I am right now, would be aware of those subsequent experiences. I go into this distinction in my essay titled, How Can I Live Forever? What Does and Does Not Preserve the Self? There is also a video by that name. But in that essay and video, I make a very clear point point that cryonics is not easily discernible as to whether or not it will preserve that inus or subjective continuity, in the sense that the preservation of that continuity of vantage point requires a continuity of some sort of bodily function, some sort of process that does not get interrupted completely. So the real question is, in cryonics, is there such a complete interruption? Now, on the one hand, cryonics has to preserve the body in as good of a condition as possible for subsequent reanimation. If too many bodily processes are allowed to continue, that would defeat the point of a cryonic suspension. On the other hand, if there is a complete cessation of all bodily processes, not even some low-key functioning going on somewhere, then that would be essentially the equivalent of the body becoming a corpse. If you reanimate the corpse, are you going to have the same process of life and consciousness and self-awareness in that reanimated body provided that everything else goes well? Or is that going to be a different process, a new process that you have started up, again with similar content, with some of the same memories, if not all of the same memories, but would the person prior to that suspension still experience what that reanimated person is going through? Or would it be the same a disconnect as an atom-by-atom -atom copy of me that was assembled from scratch 
but is not having my experiences subsequently? An interesting question, and I do not have a conclusive answer. Still, I will say it is better than nothing. But I will also say that I think the greater imperative right now is to save the lives of those who are currently alive and who may not have to die if the biological sciences progress quickly enough, if the medical treatments become available sufficiently soon, that there does not come about a question for individuals in my generation of whether or not we need to essentially make that bet of cryonics, make that leap in thinking that our subjective continuity would be preserved on the other end if the future technologies to reanimate us perhaps decades or centuries later actually come about. And of course there are a lot of uncertainties with cryonics as well. The organizational uncertainties of the same entities continuing to be financially viable and keeping the bodies of the cryopreserved patients in good condition. I think there is an earnest intent to do that, but uh, a lot of unforeseen contingencies may intervene. So my goal as an advocate of life extension is to help bring about a situation where as few people as possible need to subject themselves to those kinds of contingencies. At the same time, for other projects, other donors, uh, other individuals who are interested in life extension, if that's the path they want to pursue, if that's the approach they think is most promising, I believe that they should go for it. Essentially, exploring all possible paths is a good strategy if one desires to reach the objective because if one path doesn't succeed then uh, another path may be more fruitful. However, the path of biomedical research and reversals of senescence in those who are still legally alive seems to me to be the path that is most fruitful from this vantage point and the path in which I would invest my resources if I had substantial resources to donate. Thank you very much.